Good evening, everyone, and welcome tonight to tonight's webinar. Um, tonight's topic is carpal instability. Uh, thank you for joining us on this holiday weekend. I hope everyone is doing well and is staying safe. As everyone knows, uh, these are weekly based webinars. Uh, next week will be carpal fractures locations and um, we'll progress into June, at least the beginning of June thereafter. And if you missed any of the uh, previous ones did here, you can go to the website and uh, watch them. Um, as you know, we also have the pediatric orthopedic series going. Uh, tonight's topic is scoliosis and has a world renowned faculty um, for scoliosis, some of the uh, biggest names in the world on that topic. Um, tonight for our carpal instability, we have an uh, amazing, uh, also world renowned panel. We're gonna start our night off with uh, Sonu Jane from Ohio State, who's gonna uh, define what carpal instability is. Um, we'll then go on to the physical and radiographic evaluation from Lori Callian up in Rhode Island. We'll then go to New York to Steve Lee, who will talk to us about scapho lunar instability. We'll go to the West Coast to a young Jeff Yao, uh, who will talk to us about lunotricretial instability. And then we'll end with Scott Wolf, also from HSS, to talk about non-dissociative carpal instability. Um, so there are the two websites. Hopefully everyone knows them by now. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Snu and uh, thank everyone for joining us again. Oh, we had you and we lost you. We got you again. You're still on mute, Sanu. Sanu, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry about that. So uh, good, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna talk about carpal instability, uh, understanding the basics. This is pretty much an in intimidating topic to a lot of people and I'm not gonna go into all the complexities, but. I do want you to understand the simple basics of this. So hopefully this will form a foundation for your, uh, for your understanding of the upcoming uh, talks given by this uh, outstanding faculty. So I have no disclosures. And to understand carpal kinematics and uh, carpal instability, you really need to understand the anatomy. So carpal bones uh, of the wrist, you need to know them. So you need to know the proximal row, scaphoid, lunate, going from radial to ulnar, triquetrum, fusiform, and then the distal row, um, trape trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. So that's, that's the foundation. And then you go to the ligaments. So you have the dorsal carpal ligaments. So you can have extrinsic and intrinsic ligaments. So we're looking at the dorsum of the wrist here. And so particularly you wanna pay attention to the scapulunate uh, interosseous ligament, which is pretty uh, strong dorsally. The lunar triquetral ligament is uh, 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 strong uh, volarly. And you have these extrinsic ligaments, which are gonna be important when we talk about uh, mid-carpal uh, instability uh, later on. And so you have your dorsal radial carpal uh, ligament, which goes from Lister's tubercle and inserts uh, distally to the triquetrum uh, spanning across the lunate. And you have the dorsal intercarpal ligament, which goes from the triquetrum to the trapezoid and trapezium, also spanning across to the scaphoid as well. So then we move on to our volar carpal ligaments. So we have our, um, Ligaments here, which include our long and short radial lunate, our radius capitate, which kind of traverses over as an arc almost uh, to the mid portion of the wrist, all no capitate, all no uh, lunate ligament. And you have this weakness between the capitate and the lunate, which is a space of Poirier. And this is where the lunate can potentially dislocate uh, a space of weakness. So, carpal instability. So, what is this? Um, it was first described in 1970. Uh, by Fisk and the International Federation uh, of the Societies of Surgeons of Hand, the Committee on Anatomy and Biomechanics, defined this as uh, a wrist joint should be considered clinically unstable only if it exhibits a symptomatic dysfunction, is not able to bear loads, and does not exhibit normal kinematics during any portion of its arc of motion. So we're familiar with this uh, when we radially deviate. Uh, the wrist, we flex the scaphoid. When we ulnarly deviate the wrist, we extend the scaphoid. So let's move on to instability. So this is 
kind of what uh, is going to be discussed over the rest of the hour here. So we have carpal instability dissociative and carpal instability non-dissociative. So just to simplify this, dissociative is disruption within the row. So you're, you're looking at scaphalunate ligament disruption, lunotriquetral uh, disruption, or even a scaphoid fracture, which also disrupts that row. The non-dissociative um, carpal instability is between the radius and the proximal row, or between the proximal and distal rows, uh, which is mid-carpal instability. And then you have a third one, which is uh, carpal instability complex, which is a combination of both. Um, Carpal instability can be asymptomatic for patients or it can lead to arthritis and everything in between. So when you're looking at dissociative uh, carpal instability, um, we think of the scaphalunate ligament and, uh, and I know we're gonna talk about that later on today. Um, so you have a thin volar ligament, you have a thick dorsal ligament, uh, as you can see here, and that's the strongest and has the most important fibers. And when you do get dissociation of this, you can get a scaphalunate advanced collapse, which could potentially lead to arthritis. And likewise, you can also have the lunotriquetral dissociation, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So we have this term DZ, which is its dorsal uh, intercalated segment instability, and VZ, which is the volar intercalated segment instability. So you'll see this on your lateral x-rays. I know Dr. Kelly and will probably talk about this in her talk. But um, when you're looking at the DZ, that's more common. You get subluxation uh, of the scaphoid. Um, and the SLIL dissociation, the scaphoid flexes, and the lunate points dorsally. So what happens is your lunate is attached to your scaphoid radially and to your triquetrum ulnarly. The scaphoid likes to flex um, and the lunate likes to extend. So when you have a scaphalunate injury, the lunate goes along with the uh, triquetrum and extends, which gives you your DZ. And if you have a lunotriquetral injury, the lunate goes along with the uh, scaphoid and flexes. That's where you get the volar intercalated segment instability, and you get that spilled teacup sign, as you can see in both of these uh, cartoons here. Your normal uh, angle for uh, escape balloon at angle is about 47 degrees, and so when you're kind of getting beyond 60 degrees of, uh, of extension, uh, then you're looking at more of a DZ deformity, and likewise, when you're going below uh, 30, you're looking at a VZ. So where did this, uh, where did this term come from here? And I'm borrowing this uh, from uh, Dr. Wolf's paper here. Um, so in 1872, uh, anatomists uh, described this term intercalated bone, and this was refined later by Lansmuir. And then Linscheid uh, defined the term intercalated segment, which is just more than one bone. And he referred specifically to the proximal carpal row and only specifically to the lunate and tricretrum, devoid of the uh, scaphoid. So we move on to the carpal instability non-dissociative. Remember, this is you know, in the proximal, uh, sorry, in the radial carpal or the mid-carpal uh, joints. So usually from non-traumatic carpal subluxation, usually congenitally lax ligaments, you get a clunk with motion. The, you get intrinsic uh, in, uh, instability, non-dissociative, which is palmar uh, mid-carpal or dorsal mid-carpal. Uh, and you can have ex extrinsic, which is usually related to a dorsally angulated distal radius fracture. And this is also referred to as adaptive as well. So those are just kind of interchangeable terms. So, um, when you look at dorsal uh, carpal instability non-dissociative, it's usually caused by a laxity of the dorsal intercarpal ligament. Um, and uh, the thought is, and also the long radial lunate and radial scapal lunate ligaments, but the thought is that the dorsal intercarpal ligament serves as a, as a band to sort of hold that uh, capitate head in place a little bit, almost like a belt. And uh, you can use the term uh, carpal instability non-dissociative DZ as well, because you, you get a DZ deformity, as you can see, on this, uh, on this picture here. And likewise, you can get a palmar midcarpal uh, uh, instability non-dissociative, also known as uh, uh, VZ as well. And that's usually from a lax of the dorsal radiocarpal ligament and the trichotrohamic capitate ligament as well. So um, just to throw in a little extra on here, so if uh, Mark Garcia Elias talked about some other um, biomechanics and, and physiological manifestations of the uh, ligaments. And he showed that with axial traction of the wrist, you can get a functional distal carpal row supination uh, where the scaphoid extends um, and the um, triquetrum flex, flexes, as you can see here on this uh, A uh, diagram on both sides here. And likewise, with axial load, you get 
pronation of the distal carpal row as a scaphoid flexes over the radio scaphocapitate ligament um, and the tricretrum extends. It's a little bit beyond this, but just to keep in mind, uh, there is complexity associated with carpal kinematics as well. So then we move on to the third type, which is a carpal instability complex. So that's, um, you can get a lesser arc injury, which is purely ligamentous. You can get a greater arc injury, which is associated with a fracture, such as a transcapoid or transcapitate uh, uh, perilunate dislocation. Um, and that's involving both uh, uh, dissociative and non-dissociative components. The Palmer uh, perilunate dislocation is infrequent. Um, it's usually a lesser or greater arc pattern, and you get the dorsally displaced lunate and the fractures with the palmar capitate. The axial dislocation usually caused by traumatic, uh, traumatic wrist crush injury in a dorsal palmar direction. So um, Mayfield also describes uh, a classification of, of perilunate instability going from the scaphalunate um, clockwise to the capitulunate, lunotricretral, and then a complete lunate dislocation. And so this is something to keep in mind as well when you're looking at uh, this type of instability. So in summary, just to simplify all this, carpal instability is, is a disruption of the normal carpal kinematics that is symptomatic. So the dissociative is within the proximal carpal row. Think scaphalunate, think lunotricretral. The non-dissociative is, uh, you'll think of either two types of midcarpal, which is ligament laxity, or radiocarpal, which is adaptive, and that's usually from the malunited dorsally angulated distal radius fracture. And then when you look at the carpal instability combined, think of perilunate, and then examine, image, and treat. Thanks. Great, thank you, Sonu, for setting the stage for the rest of the evening. Uh, we're gonna move uh, to uh, Rhode Island, to uh, Lori Callant, Leanne, um, who's gonna to talk to us about the physical and radio evaluation of these injuries. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. It's lovely to be here tonight and uh, welcome to everybody who's taking time out of their holiday weekend. So, all right. I want this. Any idea why I can't advance? Usually, if you just click, it'll advance. Hmm? Oh, just click your mouse. With your mouse, not the keyboard. I don't have a mouse. Or you might have to go to screen show uh, or slideshow, I mean. Slideshow. Where are we seeing that? The bottom. At the bottom. And I'm not seeing anything. Hold on. Uh, Laura, if you go to view, you'll get to slideshow. Or slide, yeah, view. I think that, that should be it now. Hit that one. Yeah, it's. it's, it's hiding behind my screen sharing thing. Or how about slideshow? Okay, oops. Um. Two tabs uh, to the left of you. Go to slideshow. Slideshow. I don't. At the top. Oh, right there, sorry. There you go. Play from start. All righty. Okay, thanks. All right, so on today at the end of this presentation, you will hopefully be able to recognize complaints that are consistent with carpal instability, effectively examine the wrist, and use ancillary exams appropriately to help confirm your diagnosis of carpal instability. Patients who come to you with a carpal instability will frequently present with a history of a fairly large trauma. It can be a fall, other loading injury, uh, holding on to a steering wheel and uh, getting into a motor vehicle accident, some sort of a twisting or torsion injury. Um, they may say that they have clicks and clunks and it's important to ask when they get them. Uh, are they associated with activity? Are they associated with pain? Usually pain is worse and signifies a larger degree of injury. Is their pain localized? Did it go from general down to specific? Uh, do they have swelling in any specific area? Do they have subjective or objective weakness with grip? Uh, has their movement changed? And are their symptoms progressing? So it's important to ask these questions for carpal instability in addition to ruling out other things by penetrating injuries, prior operative procedures, uh, numbness or tingling, and then go forward in ruling in or out your diagnoses. 
I personally have a mini C-arm in the office and I find it's really helpful to allow evaluation if we don't have an x-ray before doing a physical exam because obviously if they're injured or have some major thing, you don't want to go you know, starting to uh, torture them. So the benefits of this is you can do a live action view to look for uh, dynamic instability and compare uh, differences to the other side. Patients don't have to go elsewhere to have films because in our system sometimes they don't come in with an x-ray or I can't get the CD to open or they're from another healthcare system. Uh, the downsides, you have to have a machine maintenance regulatory stuff, uh, but it is helpful. So look at the wrist, look for masses, look for colored uh, differences, um, have them move their wrists in all directions, compare your injured to your contralateral side in active and passive, and then you can palpate the five zones per Brown and Lichtman. So we have on the radial dorsal side in this element, we're just looking at the scaphoid. Central dorsal, you'll look at the lunate and the SL joint. The ulnar dorsal will be the luna triquetral. On the volar side, we'll be looking at scaphoid tubercle and then the pisiform. You also want to look at the arm in a lateral position to see if you can detect a sag at the wrist with possible some supination of the wrist. And these can be signs of uh, complete lunotriquetral rupture or midcarpal instability. Uh, here's a nice example of the palmar sag. And here, if you look at somebody end on, can you actually correct that? by lifting the ulnar side of the wrist to correct the LT instability or the MCI instability. You want to do provocative maneuvers for testing and ruling in or out carpal instability. Um, on the scaphalunate shuck test, you'll want to grasp the um, scaphoid tubercle with your index finger, the dorsal aspect of the scaphoid with your thumb, and go about a centimeter in line with the middle finger to have the same position with the lunate and just move them back and forth. The scaphoid shift test, which people should be familiar with, is to put the hand in ulnar deviation and hold the scaphoid between your thumb and index finger and hold it in that extended posture. As they move the hand in a radial direction, you'll feel the scaphoid pushing toward you. You suddenly let it go and see if there is an audible or palpable clunk or if it's painful. Uh, painful clunks, again, worse than a non-painful clunk, which uh, is not that uncommon. You can then try a finger extension test. So this is a sensitive one for carpal uh, pathology, but it's not specific to any specific area. Um, so have the person hold their arm out with the thumb and index fingers extended and apply volar directed pressure to see if it starts coming in toward the scapulunate uh, space. You can also have them flex the wrist slightly, apply volar directed pressure, and this theoretically is pushing the capitate into that scapulunate space and may uh, cause pain there as well. The false positives for uh, these tests are gymnast wrists or dorsal capsulitis, an occult wrist ganglion or a scapho impa scaphoid impaction against the radial styloid. So here are examples of the scaphoid shift test and the finger extension test. So for the lunar uh, triquetral exam, there's been a lot written about, but uh, they're not incredibly as precise sometimes as, as how they look. Sometimes they can be difficult to find. Um, and we'll go on to the next. So the Balotman test is doing that scaphoid again, I'm sorry, lunate against triquetrum by putting your fingers on and holding them. The shear test, um, you hold the lunate stable and use your thumb to press against the piezo triquetral complex and push that up against your lunate to see if it's pain, painful. And then the ulnar snuff box test is to push on the triquetrum between your ECU and your FCU to see if pushing it causes pain. The, um, this can also be positive in ulnar triquetral tears. So be a little bit uh, cautious about interpreting it in that way. The pisiform, because it's encased within the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon, is rarely unstable, but you can have arthritis between it and the triquetrum. And so um, rocking it back and forth can see if there's pathology at this location. For midcarpal instability, um, the patient can either show you how they have an unstable midcarpal joint or you can detect it. You can hold the hand, have them hold the hand in a tight fist and have their wrist slightly flexed. 
the wrist is slowly extended as it deviates ulnarly. And in this time, the proximal row is beginning to go from a flexed to an extended posture. The triquetrum engages on the base of the hamate and you'll get what's called a catch-up clunk. So all of a sudden there'll be this and you know that you can sometimes see and sometimes hear. Um, again, if it's painful, it's worse than if it's not painful. When you're doing this, you hold on to the, pro, uh, the forearm and the other hand applies pulmonary directed uh, pressure along with ulnar deviation and that should cause the painful clunk. Capital lunate instability is quite rare, and I love the name of this. It's the apprehension test. It's because somebody doesn't want you to do it because they know it's going to hurt. Um, and so you're, as you're stabilizing the forearm and applying dorsal directed pressure, the capitate will pop out of the lunate facet. Adjunctive tests, generally x-rays for the vast majority of patients are adequate. You want to get a series of plain films, PA, lateral oblique, and then PA with radial and ulnar deviation, a clenched fist view, and then flexion extension on your laterals. Wrist cine radiography, and can, this, you can use a mini C-arm for this, is quite helpful because you can do it in the office and look at the other side at the same time. Um, in the references, Selkers has a really good um, description of a full exam. This uh, gives you a 92% accuracy for scapholunate uh, interosseous ligament injuries. MRI is useful for diagnosis in unclear conditions. Uh, you can combine this with um, injection to see if uh, the dye is going where it shouldn't go. And uh, there's good description in uh, Kuo's article. CT can be useful for identification of fractures and analyzing bony relationships, but arthroscopy has been considered the gold standard. Here, as Dr. Jane had mentioned, uh, you have scaphoid extended when the wrist is ulnarly deviated, scaphoid flexes along with the lunate when the wrist is radially deviated. The various films, you're looking for galula's lines being parallel. Um, you're looking for the radius, the lunate, the capitate, and the metacarpals to be fully lined up. And um, you want to see if there's widening of the scapholunate space or the double ring sign. Here is a DC deformity. It's a little bit more subtle than on the last one. Again, the widened space of the Terry Thomas sign and the VC deformity, where the lunate is pouring fluid volarly as opposed to the lunate pouring fluid uh, dorsally. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Lori. We're gonna move to uh, Steve Lee who's going to talk to us about scapholunate instability. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, and thanks for organizing this. It's a great uh, course here. Uh, let's see. There we go. So, um, and thank you, Josh. I, I was taking my family to the park today, and I ran into this. Uh, this is the name of the park, and I thought of you. So I took a picture today of this park. It's right by the Vessel in New York City. So my charge is to talk about scapholunate instability in 10 minutes. So we'll start out the case, a 40 year old man with one week old injury who's symptomatic. What would you do? Non-operative, scope, pin rib paracapsidesis, tenodesis of your flavor, bone ligament bone, rassle, arthroscopic repair, internal brace, denervation, nothing until you need a salvage procedure or other. So tons of options. Let's look at this though, 40 year old man, but let's say it's not just acute, but it's six months old and symptomatic. And you have that gap, you have uh, flex scaphoid, DZ, and the same kind of options are there. Landmark paper in 1972 out of the Mayo Clinic talked about traumatic instability of the wrist, as we just heard. And it's defined as a symptomatic condition where the patient can't bear loads and has abnormal kinematics on their uh, wrist. Scaphoid is the most common wrist ligament injury and it's often missed. The scapholunate is a complex, meaning that it's the scapholunate interosseous ligament plus secondary stabilizers. The SLIL anatomy, it's a three-sided box. Dorsally is the strongest, as you, as you just heard. Proximally is the weakest, and Palmer is in the middle somewhere. Very uh, important are the secondary stabilizers, many of them, but the most important are the STT long radial lunate on the Palmer side and the DIC, dorsal intercarpal ligament, on the dorsal side. 
In categoric studies, if you divide the SLIL alone, it does not cause static radiographic change, meaning that you won't get a gap, you won't get DZ, but you may get dynamic ones. The secondary stabilizers have to be injured before static radiographic change occurs. Uh, thank you to Dr. Wolf for these uh, next three slides. Very uh, nice um, image showing the balance of the carpus when it's intact. If you injure the ligament between the scaphoid and lunate, but not the secondary stabilizers, you don't go into DZ. But when you disrupt the secondary stabilizers, it's in, out of balance, and then you go into a DZ pattern. What are the ligament secondary stabilizers that are important for causing DZ? We published this last year in JBJS. And basically, uh, once again, show that isolated SLIL injuries don't uh, produce DZ, but if you have injury to long radial lunate, STT, and DIC, these are critical stabilizers. An increase was noted when there's STT or DIC lunate or uh, with the DIC scaphoid component cut. What kind of views are best? In my opinion, you do want to include the, um, the pencil grip view. So if you look at this, uh, Journal Hansford 2011, we looked at all the dynamic views discussed in the literature. And it looks like this clinically, holding the pencil and uh, holding a piece of like a card there that's between the, um, the two hands there. And you get this kind of view and you can see that nice image showing that you can really tell a fine difference in a dynamic type view. If the static view looks like it's closed down, the dynamic view sometimes does not show that it, um, you don't have a gap there. Remember the scapulunate is a three-dimensional complex, so you do need other images to really understand this. So in axial images, you can see the dorsal scapulunate ligament. You can also see it in the proper coronals as well. But uh, I like to look at the axials on the MRI, and you can see the volar scapulunate ligament as well. On the coronals, you can see the, um, the weaker proximal component. A new parameter that uh, we have published out of our institution is the dorsal scaphoid translation. It's where the scaphoid moves dorsally and contacts the dorsal rim of the distal radius. You can see this in this uh, illustration of MRIs, the dorsal tangential line is this line that's right over here. And then in the control, you can see the scaphoid sits in the pocket of the radius in a congruent manner. But when you have dorsal translation, the scaphoid is kicked out dorsally and it sits on the, the dorsal rim, just like this. This is a static view. This is not a dynamic view, a static MRI. And once you um, start really looking at these MRIs critically, the sagittal views, you'll see these in some of these cases. That is when the scapegoat is sitting out like that, that causes pain. And this also explains why you, if you look at the proximal part of the scaphoid in a case, you'll see that worn area of cartilage at the, um, at the one part of the proximal part of the scaphoid. You can also see this on radiographs. Once you start really knowing what you're looking for, so if you look at that left-sided radiograph, you can see that nice congruent part of the lunate with the scaphoid. See how it's nice and congruent, overlapping really. And then the SLIL injured one, you can see that there is something sticking out. And if you have a really good, you know, a true lateral, you can see that, that bone sticking out. That's a scaphoid being kicked out dorsally past the dorsal tangential line. Liken it to this, the scaphoid shift test, which we know how to do. Um, I mean, just heard about it, but this is, you know, this is a dynamic type study, uh, exam, physical exam maneuver, when you um, push on that uh, distal pole of the scaphoid and you'll kick that scaphoid out. But in, the, in some instances of some patients, when it's more extreme, this will be sitting there statically and that hurts, that causes pain. It's also relative to how they do post-op, as I'll talk about in a second here. This is a cohort study that we did at our institution where we looked at people's, uh, the patient's radiographs after surgery for scapulonate problems. And uh, we wanted to see what um, parameters from the radiographs uh, correlate with pain relief. So we have a, a cohort of patients and what it was the post-op dorsal translation correlated with the presence of pain, meaning that post-op, if they had dorsal translation post-op, they still had pain. If they did not have dorsal translation, they did not have continued pain post-op. And there wasn't correlation between the things that are so much more obvious or that things that we've talked about more in the past, like scapulinate gap, um, SL angle, RL angle. Um, and this would explain why some of these patients that come back and they have, um, you know, the radiograph post-op, they gap open and you're like, oh no. And then they tell you they don't hurt that badly. And um, this is because in those cases, you probably stop them from translating dorsally. 
Look at this example of case of what I just talked about. This is a patient who's three years post-op from scapulonic repair, no complaints. If you look at that x-ray, this is a standard PA, you go, hmm, yeah, it's the, the SL is shut down, it looks good. But then if you do a clenched pencil view, look at this, it's gapped open. And uh, obviously the other side has some issue too, but this right side, it's gapped open. But if you look at the lateral, you can see that the, the scapula is not kicked out. And this patient, as I just said uh, two slides ago, is not symptomatic post-op. You can also use scope to look at this. Geisler has talked about this um, and the state and the grading arthroscopically and then staging. Dr. Wolf, who you'll hear from in a couple minutes, um, has this nice staging system you can see in the literature. What you want to do is to avoid the slack wrist. So this is a degenerative condition if you do not address this hemolinate problem and you have a lot of instability. And the first stage would be the radio styloid area. Second is the the radius of the scaphoid, and third is the mid-carpal joint. Let's talk about chronicity, acute being under six weeks, chronics over three months, um, somewhat arbitrary, but this is what's generally talked about. Now let's go on to the, the crux of it, the treatment. What do we do for these? So a few questions you have to ask yourself. Is the problem static or dynamic? Is it sitting like that on a static radiograph or not? Is the problem reducible or not reducible? Can you reduce the carpus? And is there arthrosis yet or not? And how do you define reducible? Um, I think that if you try to put joysticks in, and reduce it and it's bending 6-2K wires, uh, in my mind, this is not reducible. It's too hard to reduce. This will fail. You have a lot of options, none perfect. And a lot of those that we just talked about in the very beginning with those cases. You can repair and do any sort of capsulodesis. Do the triligament tenodesis, is a very uh, popular one um, from Mark Arcelius and Luch and uh, Stanley. And the Anafab by uh, Michael Sandow and also Dr. Wolf um, has had good success with this recently as well. Um, I think uh, this is intriguing and does um, address the multiple ligaments that are involved. Rosenvosser's Rassel, um, the screw that's between the scapula and the lunate, the SLAM procedure, arthroscopic capsule ligament is repair, internal brace with swivel lock and other techniques. And what are the outcomes? Is there any evidence? Unfortunately, majority of the literature on scapulonic treatment are level four studies. Many did not use functional outcome measures, and many have short-term follow-up, and none measured DST. Julie Adams and her group published that many of the problems um, still um, happen after surgery. We continue to struggle with the outcomes of scapulonic repair and reconstruction. And they had 20% failure rate at six months. Obviously, some of these cases don't work out. This is a uh, Rassel case I saw a couple years ago, and um, the screw had cut out and fragmented the proximal scaphoid, and I had to do a salvage procedure on this patient. This is a swivel lock case that um, I saw earlier this year, and uh, this is uh, right before pandemic, so this patient is awaiting uh, surgery for this problem. You can see fragmented uh, scaphoid and lunate. Going to a few cases, a 30-year-old man with acute fallen out of hand, See this gap in the uh, dorsal translation of scaphoid there? Now that you're, that you're looking for it, you can see it. A lot of options here. I did a scaphoid repair and capsulodesis. It was a, a fresh case, just happened a you know, week or two prior. And this is what it looked like post-op. And nine months later, uh, stayed together, I did well, uh, really probably because it was so fresh. Another case, 40-year-old man playing basketball, two weeks out of injury, scaphoid injury, that's his other side and uh, repairing capsidesis, and uh, he did relatively well, mainly because I think the dorsal translation was uh, improved. Another case, uh, fall off a mountain bike, he had a fracture that went onto a, a malunion, so he has a combination of the uh, dissociative, non-dissociative uh, problem, and uh, skip one eight, completely dissociated. Uh, a lot of options here. I chose to perform an osteotomy of the distal radius, along with the three -lig triligament tenodesis. And this is what it looked like post-op, healed, and he did well, went, uh, was able to cycle. Last case here, 39-year-old man, injury, doing ADLs. Um, you can really see that dorsal translation here in the MRI. And uh, many techniques available. I did a slam technique on him. Um, and uh, one year post-op, was holding up. Um, this is him, his motion, and he's the front person on that sailboat. 
although it's not without its problems. This is a polish where you can have uh, anchor dislodgement or fractures of the bone. So all, pro all techniques can have some issues. So what do we know? In my opinion, when working with scapulinate injury, get the bilateral clench pencil view. It's uh, very helpful, um, published in journal hand surgery. If you do get MRI, you need high quality, thin one millimeter cuts in all planes. Treatment is highly controversial still. For lesser degrees of injury, dynamic acute, more treatments probably work. For chronic injuries, less treatments probably work. And if there's bone on bone arthrosis, then go on to salvage procedure, usually a PRC or partial wrist fusion. The reduction is often lost after fixation is removed, which may or may not correlate with symptoms. And the radiographs oftentimes deteriorate if you follow long enough, but if you don't have dorsal uh, scapegoat translation, they seem to do uh, well as far as pain relief. This does not necessarily lead to reoperations. My approach for now is if I suspect scapulin injury, I get scapulin series that has the bilateral clench pencil view, MRI, if occult, splint, cortisone injection. If this fails, I go into a scope, possible debridement for a gastro one or two. For dynamic or acute injuries, repair in some sort of capsidesis I usually do. For a static reducible problem, um, I'm currently doing modified Brunelli uh, or SLAM, although um, Sky Wolf is, um, we're going to do a lab once things open up. Uh, I'm going to try the NFAB, see how that goes. If static, irreducible, or slack, then a scapegoat excision and some sort of partial wrist fusion or PRC uh, is usually uh, what I do. In the end, scapegoat instability remains to be an unanswered problem in hand surgery. Thank you to uh, Dr. Wolf for some of the slides and some of the thoughts and the collaboration throughout the years. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks Steve, for a very nice overview of a difficult problem. And thank you for including that picture early on. Uh, so we're okay. going to move to the other uh, to uh, Jeff Yao, who's going to talk about the other side of the wrist, uh, LT instability. Thanks, Josh. That's always tough to follow that. That was a great talk, Steve, uh, covering scapulonae instability in 10 minutes. That's a pretty impressive. So let me try to share my screen here. Um, are you seeing that okay, Josh? Yep, you're you're good. Am I in presenter mode or here? Let me see. Yep, you're you're good. good. No, you're okay. in regular slideshow. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, again, thank you, Josh, for setting this up first and foremost uh, to provide this educational opportunity for uh, our members um, in this unprecedented time. Um, and thanks for including me in this in this nice panel. So nothing to disclose here. So I'm talking about the ulnar side of the wrist and ulnar side of wrist pain uh, is commonly referred to as the back pain of the wrist, uh, mostly because there's a lot of stuff going on over there. And sometimes it can be very challenging to diagnose these problems, but I'll go on record in saying that I love it, especially LT ligament injuries, uh, which and, and contrary to uh, what Steve just presented from the scapulonate side, I think we have really good, reliable options to treat this problem. Um, so why don't we hear a lot about the LT ligament compared to the SL ligament? I did a recent PubMed search a couple days ago, and you look at scapulonate instability and see 640 results, whereas LT instability only one-sixth of the number of results. And so that's why I like to call this ligament the redheaded stepchild. Uh, for those of you not familiar from the Urban Dictionary, it's kind of the the less lesser uh, respected kind of ligament in the wrist, mostly because uh, it doesn't get that much press and it's not that controversial. And I think hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll understand that it's a little bit, um, it's probably because we have good ways of treating this problem. And since there's no um, controversy, there's not a lot of research being done into this ligament. So the LT ligament, our previous speakers did a very nice job setting me up with this. Um, just to review, it's a C-shaped uh, ligament, just like the SL ligament, but it's a mirror image of the SL ligament. So where's the the SL ligament um, is strongest dorsally, that the LT ligament is strongest palmarly, and it lies deep to the DRC, which also reinforces the LT ligament. Uh, I think you, uh, uh, Sanu showed this slide, or a similar slide, which shows that the LTIL, as Mark Garcielli likes to um, call it, a helical antipronation ligament. It's a transverse ligament, really dedicated to maintaining a close kinematic relationship of the, of the lunate and triquetrum. And remember, with, with axial load and ulnar deviation, the helicoid articulation of the handmate, as it impacts upon the triquetrum, it forces the triquetrum into extension. And so the LT ligament is trying to prevent that or hold 
that uncontrolled extension of the triquetrum on the ulnar side. So, the, so as you know, the lunate is sort of balancing the scapewood and triquetrum in the proximal row. When it comes to physical exam, uh, this was, uh, Lori did a nice job uh, discussing this, so I won't belabor this, but uh, it's pretty simple to examine. You basically just uh, go one finger breadth distal to the DREJ, and she spoke about the, the ballotment and shear tests. You also want to make sure you rule out a, a triquetral avulsion fracture, which are pretty common injury. The radiographs, uh, again, this is a more for review, as this was presented earlier very nicely. The normal scapulunate angle should be about around 45 to 47 degrees. Once your angle is less than 30 degrees, then you have that volar intercalated segmental instability pattern that uh, was presented earlier. And that said, demonstrated here, that so-called spilled tea cup sign. Other imaging uh, can be less effective or less uh, useful, particularly on the ulnar side of the wrist. You can identify all these other pathologies, but as was presented earlier, there's a relatively poor sensitivity and specificity, but we often get them uh, as a matter of a course in terms of uh, the diagnosis and treatment of these injuries. Sanu so also nicely uh, uh, discussed this. This is the Mayo classification or carpal instability dissociative, again, being remaining in the proximal row. Um, this is an, typically an acute injury, but it can be, uh, can be um, uh, degenerative as well, particularly with ulnar positive variants uh, and ulnar impaction syndrome. But in the, in the acute setting or traumatic setting, this is so called reverse perilunate instability pattern. Uh, and you can see uh, the natural uh, history. Um, it must, just like on the scapulunate side, you must have loss of your secondary stabilizers in order to develop that VZ deformity. Um, in the chronic or degenerative stage, you'll see that with ulnar impaction, with or without a TFCC injury. And then uh, the HALT syndrome is another uh, in, uh, um, uh, pathology that you often see, which is hamid arthrosis with an LT ligament injury, or HALT. Um, I like to call this the sort of the mirror image of the slack wrist. So instead of the scaphoid rubbing up against the uh, scaphoid facet and the um, radial styloid, on the radial side, the, the triquetrum, when the LT ligament is disrupted, will uh, abnormally wear against the proximal pole of the hamate. And so that's where you get the hamate arthrosis in the HALT syndrome. How do we treat these injuries? Uh, this is a nice algorithm uh, uh, published by Alex Shin from the Mayo Clinic in about two decades ago. It's a busy slide, I understand, but I'll hopefully take you through this individually. So the, the, the treatment is the same as for scaphalunia ligaments in the acute phase. If this is a, a, a pre-dynamic or an incomplete injury, uh, immobilization has a very good um, um, chance of healing these. Um, you see a lot of these uh, that are not complete that heal just with the mobilization alone. Muscle training, steroid injections, and then when you get to chronic injuries or complete injuries, then you're looking at reconstruction. Uh, or salvage. And when you talk about salvage, there's a lot of different options for the scapulunate side, but for the LT side, it's relatively um, um, uh, limited. You know, we basically, we have your arthrodesis or fusion of the LT interval or an ulnar shortening osteotomy. Treatment for the HALT syndrome is simple proximal pole hammy resection. Uh, we've done some work looking at microfracture, which can have some benefit, or the ulnar shortening osteotomy as well can be very powerful uh, uh, for this as well. Steve Lee just uh, discussed the Geisler classification, so I won't belabor this, but basically my treatment based on the Geisler classification, uh, which is viewed arthroscopically, is for the earlier stages, I do think that debridement with thermal shrinkage can be effective as you get into the later stages, adding the pinning of the LT interval. And then if it's completely disrupted, then you're looking obviously at a repair. If it's acute or uh, reconstruction, fusion, or ulnar shortening osteotomy, if it's chronic, and I'll go into that more later. So a quick word on shrinkage. I know this is a very controversial topic, particularly for our orthopedic colleagues. In the shoulder, it's uh, the, uh, essentially vilified, um, but I think in the wrist, it's a very powerful uh, treatment option. Basically, the thought is, is that uh, you restore stability by shrinking the collagen. There's secondary fibrobla fibroplasia and scarring. And then there's also some thought that there may be some uh, element of denervation that occurs with this treatment as well. Just as a review, remember your collagen is organized uh, in a triple helix linked by covalent bonds. And there's really two different covalent bonds. You have your heat label bonds and your heat stable bonds. So when treating, treated with the tissue heating, 
the heat label bonds are disrupted, but the heat stable bonds are, are intact. And so what happens is that there's a net shrinkage. I tell my patients sort of like putting a piece of meat on the grill, what happens, it gets smaller. Um, then over the course of six weeks of immobilization, those heat label bonds reconstitute themselves and the net um, result is a shortening of the collagen. And the fundamental difference in the wrist compared to the shoulder is that in the wrist, you can immobilize the wrist for six weeks without much clinical sequelae to allow that treatment to uh, take place. And a lot of this work was done in the sports medicine literature. The shoulder, on the uh, other hand, if you mobilize the shoulder for six weeks, then that shoulder's never gonna move again. And that's why, unfortunately, it had a lot of failures in, in treating shoulder instability. But for the wrist, I think it works very well. We showed in our lab that we do believe there's a denervation effect. Uh, as with heating of the ligament led to an ablation of all these neuronal markers that are typically seen in the ligament. Now, whether or not this is a long-standing uh, thing or whether or not reinnervation occurs is unknown, but at least at time zero, we believe there's some denervation that contributes to the pain relief that these patients see with this treatment. So this is what it would look like before and after the treatment. Uh, and here's a higher grade. You can see the K-wire is traversing across the uh, LT interval, and you can see the, um, this would be for a Geisler grade three. So what are the clinical results? There's really not a lot in the literature uh, for LT ligament injuries. This is a combined scapulonate and LT paper, 16 patients, and you can see the, the outcomes were quite good. Uh, we did a similar study looking at this case, in this case, only at scapulonate ligament injuries. Uh, the number of LT ligament injuries treated with this are relatively low. But suffice it to say, these patients did well, thereby sort of giving some um, credence to the efficacy of, this, of the uh, thermal treatment. For, what about for your acute complete injuries? Uh, I think, um, as Steve pointed out, a, su a straightforward suture anchor repair is very useful on the ulnar side as well as the scapulonate side. Well, what about for the chronic injuries? I'll spend the rest of my time speaking about where the ligament's no longer reparable. Uh, there's a number of reconstructions that have been described. This one was described by Bishop and Shin, uh, the Mayo Clinic, which is, I think, a very nice technique using a distally based strip of the ECU uh, to re uh, uh, reconstruct the LT ligament. And here's some clinical photos from their paper. Arthrodesis uh, has also been discussed, um, and uh, that's simply putting a cortical uh, bone between the uh, lun uh, lunate and triputrum, and then either putting compression screws or K-wires there. Uh, as you can see here. The problem with the arthrodesis, however, is their relatively high complication rate. So the reported non-union rates can go up to 60%. These patients also be, have to be immobilized for quite a long period of time, eight to 10 weeks. There's risk of ulnocarpal impingement. And uh, in multiple studies, there's unpredictable pain relief and, and, pa and decreased patient satisfaction. So I don't have a lot of experience with this because I, I just don't think it's uh, the best treatment option. Uh, from the Mayo Clinic, they also did a nice paper published in 2001 looking at uh, patients treated with either uh, with a chronic LT injury with either ECU reconstruction, as described earlier, uh, an attempt at repair, or the fusion. And you could see that uh, the complication rates were over 80% for the fusion, pretty, pretty bad. And then the probability of not requiring a reoperation was uh, the highest for the reconstruction whereas the fusion, uh, 20, only 20% um, did not need a second uh, operation. What about ulnar shortening osteotomy? This is my treatment of choice for a chronic LT ligament injury. This was first described by Milch in 1941, and its initial, uh, it, its initial description was for leveling of the radial arti ulnar articulation in your ulnar impaction uh, type patients, and that there, thereby decompresses the ulnar carpal joint. But the secondary benefit is that it tightens the ulnar extrinsic ligaments, the ulnar lunae, ulnar triputra, and ulnar uh, capitate ligaments, thereby helping to stabilize that ulnar carpus, uh, hence the LT stability that's restored. And there's a lot of evidence to support the ulnar short osteotomy. In my mind, it's the final common pathway for ulnar impaction syndrome, chronic or even acute TFCC injuries. In some countries, they'll just shorten the ulna uh, and not address the TFCC itself. Um, and then for LT ligament injuries as well. Uh, and there's a paper uh, by Athamirza which showed 53 patients treated with ulnar shortening osteotomy for chronic LT IL, and you can see their uh, results are quite good. So LT injuries are relatively common, but overlooked cause of ulnar side wrist pain. The TFCC injury is not the only cause of ulnar side wrist pain. 
Remember that. Uh, the diagnosis is not as challenging as you think. Imaging is less helpful on this side. Uh, and I think for treatment, the initial should always be conservative. conservative. Uh, but then if you have a dynamic um, instability pattern, arthroscopy plus or minus thermal shrinkage can be effective. For the static uh, acute ones, the repair uh, can be employed. But for the chronic, uh, I prefer the ulnar shortening osteotomy over the others. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Jeff. Uh, very nice overview of the LT instability. So we're gonna end um, with our last speaker, Scott Wolf, back from uh, New York at HSS, uh, who you saw is uh, well versed on the topics of carpal instability. He's gonna talk to us about the non-dissociative types. Thanks for joining us, Scott. Uh, I think you're on mute still. All right, better? Yes. Good. It's time for the redheaded stepchild. All right. So um, we have about 10 minutes left. I'll try to move through this. One of the problems with uh, SIN is it's uh, very complex. The, mutters, the waters have been muddied a bit. And uh, I think it's important for us to understand the terms. I have no financial interest to disclose. Um, carpal instability, as we've heard, comes in a number of flavors. Dissociative, meaning a disruption of the interosseous ligaments, as uh, Steve talked about. This talk will be about the non-dissociative. So their ligaments are disrupted, but they're between the carpal rows or between the radio, between the radius and the radiocarpal joint. Uh, complex is, as we heard, perilunates, uh, longitudinal disruptions of the carpus, et cetera, and adaptive tends to be with uh, another cause, like a distal radius fracture malunion. So we're going to concentrate the next few minutes on non-dissociative instability. The working definition from the IWIW, this is abnormal force transmission or kinetics across the proximal carpal row, which is manifested by abnormal static or dynamic motion or kinematics of the entire proximal carpal row. And that's what's important here. The entire proximal carpal row moves abnormally as a unit. Here's an example of a type of sin. This is what we all think about as mid-carpal instability, and we'll get into that in a minute. But this is that catch-up clunk, and you can see his entire triquetrum and lunate are popping up and down or well, the entire proximal row are popping up and down as he goes from radial to ulnar deviation. Carpal instability non-dissociative is a general class of instability, and it involves the radiocarpal joint, the midcarpal joint, or both joints. There's no break in the ligaments of the, of the proximal or the distal carpal row, and there are multiple different types and multiple different etiologies. What I'd like to get across, if nothing else, and this is what we tried to publish in this article back in 2012, is that not carpal instability non-dissociative is not synonymous with what we tend to call mid-carpal instability. Uh, huge amount of credit to David Lickman for bringing this all uh, to our attention and describing the catch-up clunk and many, many other things. But I, I think that calling this mid-carpal instability is actually a misnomer, and we should get away from that. Mid-carpal instability should refer only to a problem at the mid-carpal joint. Instead, it is a confusing term with little consensus. It in, this, what we're thinking of today as ulnar midcarpal instability is actually involving both the midcarpal and the radiocarpal joints. The entire proximal row is malaligned and multiple ligaments on both sides of the proximal carpal row are involved. So we should really think of this instead as proximal carpal row instability. The definition implies a disorder confined to the midcarpal joint and the traditional treatment of this has been to fuse or reconstruct the midcarpal joint. And if you fuse across the midcarpal joint, it leads to impairment of, of the important midcarpal joint function uh, and motion. So we know that the midcarpal joint is responsible for the dart throwing motion. It's increasingly recognized for recreational, occupational, and household activities. This tremendous uh, video by Hisham Moritomo shows the motion that's occurring around essentially a spherical midcarpal joint. So midcarpal joint, midcarpal instability is a misnomer. The term should only be used to describe clip wrist, and Lori talked about that a little bit earlier. This term, what we think of as midcarpal instability is better, better thought of as proximal row instability or SIND combined, carpal instability non-associative combined, because it's combined injury to the midcarpal and the radiocarpal joints. 
The correct terms we need to use are SYNVZ and SYNDZ. And treatment should be aimed not at crossing the midcarpal joint, but at stabilizing the proximal row. Very different. So here are the, here's the large group, carpal instability on dissociative. It can be thought of in three different types. Radiocarpal, what we think of as what you see here. The entire carpus is subluxed palmarly or ulnarly, as we see here. And then midcarpal really should be confined to this clip wrist that Dean Lewis described, or uh, capital lunate uh, combined instability uh, that Carrera and Johnson described. And then we have this bigger term, which is the combined carpal instability, non-dissociative VZ and DZ. And that's by far the biggest group. And there you can see an example of each, one of severe VZ and one of DZ. In these cases, all of the intercarpal ligaments between in the proximal carpal row are normal. So the variants. Radiocarpal SYND can come in these three flavors, dorsal subluxation of the carpus, volar subluxation of the carpus, or ulnar translatory deformities. Ulnar transitory deformities and volar generally are due to inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and sometimes CPPD. It involves panligamentous damage. The post-traumatic panligamentous damage around the proximal carpal row. Post-traumatic is the second biggest type, and generally this comes from wrist dislocations, and you can see the entire carpus is translated ulnarly, and there's no break in the proximal carpal row. This can be acutely treated with acute ligament reconstruction. I want to thank Oren Franco for contributing this case. This was his preoperative plan to reconstruct the radioscapal capitate long radiolunate ligaments. This is what it looked like in the operating room with these beautiful labels, and that's what it looked like postoperatively. So a massive reconstruction of the ligaments uh, supporting the proximal carpal row. In a chronic situation, we really have nothing else to do except fuse part or all of the proximal row to the radius. This would be a radiolunate fusion, and you can have a radioscapal lunate fusion. Let's move on to what's called syn midcarpal. And this, again, is a disorder only of the midcarpal ligaments that leads to this uh, dysfunction called CLIP or CCI. It is uncommon. The lunate generally is in neutral posture to slightly dorsal, but not easy. The capitate subluxes dorsally with stress or in patient activities, and it pops right out of that midcarpal joint. The treatment is usually non-operative with therapy. Capsular invocation has been described by both of these sets of authors. What we think of as midcarpal instability or palmar ulnar midcarpal instability has been called in literature is really sin combined. Again, ligaments on both sides of the proximal carpal row, or better thought of as sin VZ in its most common form. It's a snapping wrist described by Boucher in 34. It's characterized by the volar sag that Laurie pointed out earlier and uh, a lunate flexion or VZ deformity. People have difficulty pouring without having their proximal carpal row pop. And Lichtman described the catch-up clunk, which has been described earlier today. I'm gonna to show this is, is being done here. This is actually my son when he was seven or eight years old. You can see his pro whole entire proximal row is clunking back and forth very easily. And that's due to childhood ligamentous laxity. Most of these patients do have ligamentous laxity. In fact, 70% of synvesis have severe ligamentous laxity. In those that are traumatic, it involves injuries to the ulnar half of the arcuate ligament, you can see here in the red, and or the dorsal radio triquetral or dorsal radio carpal ligament, as you again can see here in the red, and or the SDT ligaments can be involved. And Brian uh, Harley was very uh, involved in a recent cataveric study looking at this. If you want to examine the opposite wrist, there will generally be lax, but they sometimes don't have the catch-up clump. Baroscopy can be very helpful to show deformity like this as you bring them from radial to ulnar deviation. What about Sendizi? Really, really rare, and it's usually traumatic. That's what, why I've added the T here. We now call this Sendizi, or traumatic. It's post-traumatic. It happens after non-displaced scapegoat fractures, and we've submitted this article to the Journal of Hand Surgery. It also happens after distal radius fractures, and uh, Fernandez and Folk uh, just published this last year. Uh, look for it. If you're not aware of it, you'll miss it. This is an avulsion of the entire dorsal ligamentous complex off the lunate, which allows the lunate to tip up into DZ, as you see in this 14-year-old uh, over here. It's a difficult one to treat. If you don't catch it acutely, you're going to miss it, and it will become chronic and unrepairable. The long radial lunate ligament is also implicated in this. This is something I think will help you understand this. This should be thought of as the entire proximal carpal row as a boat at a mooring. The most stable mooring is with four anchors, and that's how the lunate represented here as the proximal carpal row is anchored. The restraints to DZ are the dorsal intercarpal ligaments attachment on the lunate that I just showed avulsed, and the long radial lunate ligament. The restraints to VZ are the ulnar midcarpal capsule and the ulnar arcuate ligament on the one side, 
and the dorsal radiocarpal ligament on the other side. So if you have injuries to these, you're going to tip into DZ. And conversely, if you have injury to these, you're going to tip into DZ. And that's the entire proximal carpal row. So what are the treatment caveats? This is often atraumatic and don't overtreat this. Ligamentous laxity is likely. They usually respond to conservative treatment. Uh, it rarely progresses to arthritis. There you see the x-rays again. Activity modification, this use of the uh, splint that our, our therapists love to hate, the piece of form boost splint. They'll make it for you and you'll use it and patients will throw it away. But um, it's been described in the literature, it, it uh, is a very bulky thing to wear. Alternatively, you can cast them for a short period of time in older deviations. Sometimes this will correct, correct it acutely in trauma situations. Uh, isometric strengthening has been proposed by Garcia Elias. Other things, capsule ligaments, uh, imbrication, tendon grafts and reconstructions and fusions. This by David Lichtman. Because the dorsal radiocarpal ligament is redundant, he'll de describe cutting it and overlapping it and imbricating it together in a pants over vest reconstruction. This was also recently described by Herbert von Schrober, uh, who makes a small incision, opens up the dorsal capsule ligament off the uh, dorsal radiocarpal ligament and imbricates that with a number of sutures. These are very effective. He showed that in 27 patients. Um, and then capsule uh, shrinkage, as, um, as uh, Jeff just talked about, 15 risks in 13 patients. Ian Har Hargraves, at five years, uh, these patients have done very well. Three, I'm sorry, three and a half years of follow-up, improved function, symptoms, and dash scores. So lots of different ways to treat this if you have to. I would avoid fusing the mid-carpal joint, as we talked about earlier. Uh, uh, Rao and Culver uh, showed that this led to mixed results and only 55% good to excellent. Back to the future, the radial lunate fusion is probably my go-to procedure for these severe uh, uh, proximal carpal row instabilities. It stabilizes the proximal carpal row in neutral, but preserves the mid-carpal joint. Take off the distal scapegoat if you'd like, take out the triquitum if you'd like, but preserve the mid-carpal joint to get more motion. One such patient with gross instability, as you see here, uh, we treated him with a uh, radial lunate fusion in neutral, and this is his motion later on. At two years. So what makes sense to me, radiocarpal acutely repair them with a ligament reconstruction. Chronic, it's going to need a proximal, uh, sorry, radiocarpal fusion. In mid-carpal instability, very rare. Treat these non-operatively almost all the time. Imbrications have been described. And in the Palmer sin BZ or the occasional sin DZ, arthroscopic shrinkage has been described as being effective for recalcitrant patients, radiolunate fusion. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much, Scott. I want to thank all the panelists for joining us on this holiday weekend, taking the time out. Um, hopefully that was a useful session for everybody. Um, this will conclude our webinar tonight on carpal instability, and uh, we'll be jumping over to our other platform for the uh, just talk. Uh, thank you all and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Josh. All right. Have a great one. Take care. Thanks, everyone.